modern writers have abandoned the historical method of approach. They persist in confusing the question, what they might have wished that Jesus had been, with the question, what Jesus actually was. In reading one of the most popular recent books on the subject of religion, I came upon the following amazing assertion. Jesus, the author says, concerned himself but little with the question of existence after death. In the presence of such assertions, any student of history may well stand aghast. It may be that we do not make much of the doctrine of a future life, but the question whether Jesus did so is not a matter of taste, but an historical question, which can be answered only on the basis of an examination of the sources of historical information that we call the Gospels. And the result of such examination is perfectly plain. As a matter of fact, not only the thought of heaven, but also the thought of hell, runs all through the teaching of Jesus. It appears in all four of the Gospels. It appears in the sources, supposed to underlie the Gospels, which have been reconstructed, rightly or wrongly, by modern criticism. It imparts to the ethical teaching its peculiar earnestness. It is not an element which can be removed by any critical process, but simply suffuses the whole of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' life. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. These words are not an excrescence in Jesus' teaching, but are quite at the center of the whole. At any rate, if you are going to remove the thought of a future life from the teaching of Jesus, if at this point you are going to reject the prima facie evidence, surely you should do so only by a critical grounding of your procedure. And my point is that that critical grounding is now thought to be quite unnecessary. Many modern writers simply attribute their own predilections to Jesus without, apparently, the slightest scrutiny of the facts. As over against this anti-intellectual tendency in the modern world, it will be one chief purpose of the present little book to defend the primacy of the intellect, and in particular, to try to break down the false and disastrous opposition which has been set up between knowledge and faith. 